Tom, actually, maybe we could loop back around to Dave Brooks' question from earlier. What would have happened if you had not delivered on your earbuds? To That's a very good question. <laughs> not that we got close to it. Um, I, I, I will tell you this. Um, just uh, uh, a little bit of insight into if you go to a Kickstarter, the, there's a, a very wide range of creative projects. And the technological ones, while some of them have, you know, really hit the stratosphere, Pebble Watch, <laughs> some of those others, I mean, have just taken off. You know, there's not nearly as many of those on there as some of the others. And, um, and this is my own interpretation, kind of looking in. Um, I believe that they're throttling back a little on some of the hardware stuff because it is very easy. Well, you folks saw that, okay, I'm making earbuds. This is not like Arduino boards. But nonetheless, it's very easy to say I can make this stuff and then put it up on there. People pledge, you know, you know, all sorts of money to you, and then all of a sudden it's like, now you got to make it. I hope you know what you're doing. Um, so to answer your question, there, there have been some people who have not completed their projects. There was one um, where somebody had, I know this is, a, I use this as a um, example a lot. Uh, somebody was selling a, a, a bowl with jellyfish in it. Anybody see that one by chance? Anyway, uh, jellyfish, and um, and the video was beautiful, and they had these little pumping jellies in there that you put on your desk, and I thought, my God, we're going to do well with that, and he did. I think he sold three hundred thousand dollars worth of them. I'm coming around with the That's earbuds, by the way, yeah. <laughs> and I looked at it and I thought, you know, here I am with earbuds, you know, making something that really makes sense, and he's got three hundred thousand dollars. Think about this for a minute. Now, when you go into PetSmart and you go into some of the aquarium places, do you ever see a fish, you know, a little salt water thing with pumping jellies in it? Well, you don't, because it probably doesn't work well. But this fellow did this, he collected an awful lot of money. If you want to see some interesting comments, go to, you know, go to Kickstarter, type in jellyfish, it'll come right up. They're living two or three weeks, everybody's having problems with them. So, you know, what's that fellow going to do? Um, I don't know, but he promised something that he couldn't deliver. And, you know, hey, I'm sure his intentions were good. He's a, uh, I think he's a biology student, may have masters in, in marine biology on the West Coast and so on, and he probably got his tank to work real well. But all the others, did. by the way, these things are three to four hundred bucks. Oh, yeah. Um, so, okay, back to Iron Buds. So, what's he going to do? I don't know. But with the iron buds, yeah, we ran into a lot of snags. As a matter of fact, if you want to know a little bit, believe it or not, this connector between the earbud itself and this right here, I mean, um, you know, anybody's in the technical sciences is, you know, there's there's a hundred thousand of these things, right? I mean, there's there's catalogs just filled with little connectors. Well, we had an awfully hard time trying to get them. Um, we can't use mil spec connectors. We can't buy a military connector that goes on this that costs eight dollars. You know, so that that cuts down the population a lot. So we had to do an awful lot of looking at different vendors. We went through five of them, and it took almost six months to just solve the little connector problem on here. So was I ever worried we weren't going to pull it off? No, but boy, some of my, some of my clients were um, because it was taking so long. Well, what would happen if we didn't pull it off? Um, well, I certainly thought that through, and you know, this is something everybody should know. You know, there's not a lot of recourse, and this is two reasons. Matt may be able to weigh in on this. One is financial. The people paid for most of this stuff by a credit card. Chargebacks are 90 days. In other words, if you put something on a card and the, and the vendor doesn't give you that something, you can go to your credit card company. This is what it used to be in the old days. And in, in 90 days, you can say, the guy never shipped it. I want my, you know, go, go take money from him and give it to me. Well, these Kickstarter things are going on way more than 90 days. They're going on half a year, three quarters of a year. So I don't believe there's any recourse on chargebacks. It's purely on you delivering the product. 
And so in some cases, there's gonna be people out there doing these, not intentionally fraudulently, but they're not gonna deliver the product. And I do not believe there's any recourse. On Kickstarter's site, there is verbiage about, you know, they are the intermediary here. You do not go to Kickstarter for refunds and so on. So um, who asked that question? Yeah, uh, so, oh, so, so Dave, yeah. actually. Yeah. Who was it? Yeah, Dave, does that answer your question? Tom, not yeah, so basically, PayPal. yeah. Um, PayPal, I don't know. That's a good because question. Because Amazon uses PayPal. That's true. That yeah. is true. That is true. Okay. Good. No, I mean, it seemed to me there was no recourse at all. Yep. And, you're, and I can't believe nobody's gone up with a big scam and collected 250 grand with no... You know, the funny it. thing is, is, um, uh, Mike, you're still on here, right? I am for um, You know, uh, internationally, I'm not as well read, but you know, um, in, the, in the United States, I'm pretty well read. There's been very little fraud on 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 crowdfunding, and this is one yeah. of the big things that Mike and the others, you know, um, uh, fed back to Congress and and to the lawmakers that it, you would think it would be just ripe for fraud, but you know, the internet is so transparent that people can see what's going on. If, and if they, you know, you can research somebody pretty easily. And as I, as from what I understand, I believe there's only just a few instances of fraud on, on any of the major sites. Yeah. A lot yeah. of unintentional, you know, the guy doing the jellyfish, which yeah. I hope you pull that off, sir. But you know, if you don't, he didn't mean to do that. It just happened. Um, why there isn't more of it, I don't know. Mike, did you want to I mean, weigh in? That we, we heard about it a little bit earlier, which is when you have thousands of eyeballs looking at a profile, I mean, this is why crowdsourcing works, that someone among those thousands of people is going to say, this looks fishy, or I actually know something specific about this person or about this industry, and this doesn't make any sense. And then one that, once that person can post it and draw attention to that detail, now everyone's looking and, and the kind of, you know, due diligence, which I think we've we heard from perspectives saying that that's not going to be done effectively with crowdsourcing or crowdfunding. I think that a certain type of group due diligence is actually done extremely effectively by, by crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. And that's kind of the, the genius of the wisdom of the crowd is that those lessons can flow to the surface. Um, as long as enough people are looking at the problem. Yeah, that's exactly right. Especially, Mike, when they've got their money at stake. Well, you've got people that are you know, interested in investing in this, and you've got several thousand of them. Oh, you've got a lot of real good research going on there. Right. Now, just, just, just on that, the question maybe for, for Mike, too, is it'll be interesting, I think, to see how the lack of fraud on Kickstarter with those kinds of projects translates into the equity crowdfunding world. And hopefully it's a direct comparison, um, but 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 I think part of the part of the unknown is whether it is or not, and is equity crowdfunding for some reason more ripe for fraud than the Kickstarter world? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I I wouldn't think so. I mean, again, there's there's more legislated. Um, preventative measures that the crowdfunding portals have to put in place, like identity verification and actually doing background checks. I mean, we're gonna have folks connecting their social networks. I mean, there's a number of ways where you make it a very high risk endeavor to actually try to try to defraud people for, for some money. And on top of that, you have to actually have a profile or a product which is compelling, you know? Um, and I think I've heard it from a number of people. There are far easier ways for you to defraud people out of a few thousand dollars and spinning up a big company and going through all the hard work of a big identity and somehow being a background check and all those things. Yeah, I agree completely. Question? Got it. Question for Mike before we lose him. Um, Mike, I wondered if you're, uh, as part of the offering that you're doing through the portal, are you, uh, how, what level of standardization in terms of the presentation of the companies is there going to be to allow investors to really compare opportunities one across the other easily? So there will be a standard set of questions that companies have to answer. Um, and then obviously as folks kind of have specific variables that are more meaningful for their companies or their, their industries, they're encouraged to answer those those questions. Um, I think the key piece here when we get back to due diligence points is that folks will actually be able to ask questions and ask for clarification and some, some more kind of in-depth answers. <clears throat> and that will be displayed down on their profile. They know and the entrepreneur can choose to say, you know, that's, that's sensitive and we don't really want to make that public. Um, but there will be this kind of iterative process whereby companies are going to have to answer real questions um, that's going to be akin to any due diligence process they would go through with a traditional investor. And that all plays out in public on the site? 
Yeah, so there will be pieces of it that will play out in public and pieces of it that will play out in private. Again, entrepreneurs will have kind of pieces of information that they don't want to be completely public. Um, and so they can approve folks that apply to kind of, you know, have that deeper level of insight into the offering um, to then, again, you know, show them some more, some more of what's under, under the skirt, so to speak. So this is for Mike specifically. Mike, the, the story that had been evolving in the last three months was that the SEC hated crowdfunding and was going to drag it out, maybe get it past the, the election and watch it get watered down in Congress, or just generally was going to make it take as long and be as painful as possible because it fundamentally doesn't trust it, doesn't like it, doesn't know how to regulate it. Do you agree that that's the SEC's uh, posture, number one? And number two, if that is at all true, yeah. is it because they're a captured agency and there are money and interests that are upset about crowdfunding, or is it just bureaucratic uh, thinking that gets in the way? Yeah, so I think there's, there's a, there was definitely a lot of fear of that uh, right after the, the legislation passing, and I know we had some of that ourselves. <clears throat> but I can tell you, after, after being with them for an entire day, a week ago on Friday, it really could not be farther from the truth. Um, they are, you know, completely understand the, the, the job creation and economic impact of, of crowdfunding. I mean, they, they every every uh, rule that goes to the SEC now goes through an economic analysis, <laughs> and they, they see what this can mean for the country. So we're not at all concerned that they are kind of doing some underhanded way of, of, of blocking it and, and preventing it from, from taking place. Um, and I, I, I don't really get concerned at all about them being a, a moneyed interest um, in, in that way either. They're, they're even actually relatively uh, insulated from, from Congress at this point, for better or for worse. Um, if something is not in the letter of record or in the legislation itself, they definitely take advisement um, from what the, the elected officials have to say, but apparently there's no legal mandate for them to act on, on um, comments or opinions that are made after the fact that we're not caught by the legislative process. So, so Mike, just a question for you from the entrepreneur's standpoint. So you talked about crowdfunding and how it can help raise equity, but I think no matter what, when you're talking to investors, whether they be certified or not, there's the value that that person brings because obviously they bring things to the table. And when you get an accredited investor, obviously there's some thoughts that they have more of that value. When you get people that are in a crowdfunding platform, where is the check and balance for the entrepreneur to say, you know, I'm not really sure if I want you on my cap table because of your experience and what you have there, not just thinking of it solely that I need the capital to be able to do that. Because I think that still needs to come into play no matter, you know, if it's a certified investor or not. How does your platform allow the entrepreneur to look at that? I think, I think that's a great point. So what's different about our platform is that there is not just a invest button and then you put the money in and, and um, get your, your product or or in this case, it would be shares. You have to actually apply to invest, and then you're approved by the entrepreneur. So the entrepreneur can go through a scrubbing process and say, okay, you know, we want to have investors that use this profile, that have this much social media reach, or have this kind of, uh, of experience in the industry, um, or we only want to take investors that are going to invest a certain amount of money. Um, and the entrepreneurs will have a lot of control over who they ultimately let in the field if they do not. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, you talked about some of the projects you had that were unsuccessful. <laughs> 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 could you go into those a little more and talk about some of the lessons learned from those and how you would apply those to try to do a successful project in the future? Okay. I was hoping those would come up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, and, and I can tell you what I learned from them too. Um, let's see, there were so many of them. No, no. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Star Wars watches too? Uh, they did. They did. Uh, by the way, I had a, a watch project myself, but I, there's one of them right there. I, I didn't do an electronic watch. The guys that hit 300, 400,000. I, I, I sold an awful lot less than that. But mine, mine was a, 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 a collectible kind of watch. Um, okay, here's, here's one that I tried out. And, I, you know, I'd love to get feedback on this because it never went anywhere. It, this was about a year and a half ago before I learned a lot more about crowdfunding than I know now. Um, 
I think if there's anything you want to take from, from this about the, the standard reward-based crowdfunding, and, and someone over here was speaking to this also, if you do a project and you don't promote it, you're just not going to pull any money into it. I don't know how many projects are on Kickstarter right now, but I think I saw something like 50 or 60,000. So it's this sea, it's just this sea of projects on Kickstarter. And Kickstarter is only one of them. You know, there's all these other sites. People do not go to Kickstarter. Hey, I'm going to go to Kickstarter today because I have money in my pocket that I want to burn. That's not who's on Kickstarter. There, oh, there's a little bit of that. You know, people say, hey, what's hot, what's new, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but for the most part, um, the guys that did the wristwatches that just hit the stratosphere, um, I don't know if we think, we, the, the first one that hit almost a million was this thing called the TikTok watch. The TikTok watch was basically a band that you put an iPod Nano into, okay? iPod, this is the iPod Nano was just released he came up with a band so you can put it on your wrist. And he sold close to a million dollars worth of that. How did he sell a band that you put an iPod Nano into and make almost a million? Because the Apple people, the Apple loyal, you know, stumbled upon it, it went viral. It went everywhere. And there's an awful lot of loyal Mac fans and uh, you know, Apple fans that said this is outrageously cool. They came flooding back into Kickstarter and the thing just took off from there. So, back to my project. Um, I had an idea for a kind of computer mouse that you could design and customize yourself. Um, a computer mouse, it's a, you know, it's a utility kind of device. Um, it has, the, the electronics in it are kind of well, you know, established. You can get um, computer mice from probably a thousand different companies in China. We were going to make a mouse that you made your own body for it. And, we, and this is a design project, perfect Kickstarter project, perfect. Um, you could put your own body on, it was basically a platform with mouse, you know, innards in it. It was an infrared, you know, mouse, and you made your own body. For instance, you could put a hockey puck on it. So we thought, now that's not going to engage hockey enthusiasts to have a, you know, this is the kind of thing that, is this going to be the mouse you use all day long for doing CAD drawing? No. But it's like, what a cute gift for $25. It's got a mouse, it's a you know, mouse body that has the Stanley Cup winner on it. And we designed it so you could put on a whole multiplicity. We had different bodies of stones and rocks and coral and stuff like that. We thought that would do super. You know, how unusual. What a neat gift product. Tom, Tom what was yeah. key, what's a key word for that product? Um, please don't laugh too hard. <laughs> Pimp my mouse. <laughs> I assume the page is still up. Yeah, the, the page is still up, but you know, some of the... There it is. <laughs> Funding unsuccessful. Oh. Okay, there you go. You know, I just realized I have to leave now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, folks. There's Pimp My Mouse. Now, um, what did we learn from that? We did not do the outreach that we should have. This should have gone and been on all the social media. It should have been, you know, everywhere. And um, and we didn't really get, well, actually we got no one <laughs> that pledged to this. And so this is a good example, actually, of not the product itself, um, you know, being a complete loser. I still have people look at this and go, hey, that's kind of a cool idea. But we didn't promote it, it didn't go viral. So, boy, there's a takeaway for you. That's not really, Please don't tell me. It's not really that stupid a product. It's kind of cool, right? Um, but it didn't go anywhere because we didn't promote it. We did this by the time, same time as Iron Buds, and Iron Buds got all our promotions on it. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes you do these things, and they could be the best intention, and they go nowhere. I, I, it's a question related to that. I mean, I wonder, I don't know if Kickstarter reviews projects, but with the Stanley Cup and the logo and did the NHL send them a letter to say, hey, what's up with that project on Kickstarter? You're, 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 you're misusing our trademark? Yeah, that's a, no, I don't think so, because they would have taken it down. 
Um, but th that is something to be concerned about, by the way. What about, but you did, the watches that you did, um, they were Star Wars branded, weren't they? Yeah. So were there, there would be maybe some concerns around that too? <laughs> There, there would be. Um, <laughs> we don't need to get into that. Yeah. 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 Everybody work for Lucas. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we did make a Star Wars collectible watch, and we actually did quite a bit of research. Uh, one of the, uh, well, I think Coke may be somewhat larger, um, but if uh, if you ever want to have a, um, a quick phone call from somebody with a legal degree. Do something that touches upon the Lucasfilm licensing <laughs> enterprise. Um, I actually used to work for a company that had that had ties to Lucasfilm, and they have a department out there, some 20 legal fellows, and all they do is protect the Lucasfilm mm -hmm. stuff. So anyway, that's just something to be concerned about. Um, yeah, that's a very good point with this. If it did happen, Matt, I think they would have just taken it down. You had a question? Yeah, I had a follow-up question for Tom. You, yeah. did, you described your Earbuds as a project, but what happened to, um, to it as a company after you did this project? That's a very good question. Uh, um, you know the, the diagram showing the valley of death there? Well, that's the seed time, right, where you get your product up and running. We got through the valley of death. I mean, I think you could say reasonably that, you know, a Kickstarter is really kind of seed money. You know, it gets you through and up into, you have a real company in your hands, you have all of our designs are done and so on. We are at the point right now, and if anybody is interested in talking to me about this, I would love to talk to you further, where we need expansion money. Because we've literally developed a company. I can put a purchase order in right now and make 100,000 of these if I wanted to. Um, we're shipping them to all our, you know, when the feedback coming back is very good. But you don't get enough money to take it to the next level. So, you know, something, something to keep in mind. The equity crowdfunding, and I think we've learned from Matt, you know, let's tread lightly on this, and, um, um, and Mike, you know, let's, there's, a little, there's a little bit more shakeout going on. If you're gonna be doing some crowdfunding and you're starting a company, this is another real important takeaway for you. Take it from me, I've done it several times now. Um, you get just to the point where you've got a company right in your hands, and then you need expansion capital because you need inventory, you need physical space, and so on and so forth. Does that answer your question? Yeah, well, it sounds like it substitutes for the sort of second round of friends and family. Because you, you would hit that point anyway. You, what you might be able to do, and the, the problem is, you know, capital is difficult for small business. Um, we're, yes, we've gone through the seed round. We could not go to a bank, though. It's not, we're not that solid yet. And we might be able to go to, I don't know, perhaps, perhaps angels, uh, you know, Matt, uh, I'm not sure, we haven't done that yet, but, but, but we certainly do have to get to that point. You, you get enough money through this Kickstarter stuff, really, to uh, develop everything and do your projects. And, and, and then you're left with next step, you know? But I think what, one thing that we did talk about that helps when you go to investors, if it's been tested by the market, first of all, you have a product, it's been tested, you know people want to buy it. Um, it's good and bad, so you've tested the market, you know there's a market. Now the question is, is the market big enough to entice an investor? Have you tapped the market with what you've already sold? Um, but at least you have a little bit more data so that when you do start talking to people who can invest more significant amount of capital in a large chunk, you have more information. Yeah, and, and, and just one other thing, you know, it's very easy to take a look at some of these projects on Kickstarter and say, my God, he has, or she has, um, come up with this great idea and now they're off and running with this wonderful business and never looking back. You know, it's not really quite that easy. Um, even, uh, well, the Pebble Watch fellow, I, I forget how many they have to sell, but, you know, he now has, whatever, 45,000 customers. And, you know, all that is, that's a lot of resources to take care of now, those, all those people. Every one of them has his email address. Every single little issue is going to come in. That fellow, the first thing he's going to have to do is hire a fairly substantial staff. And uh, so it's, it's very easy to look at this and say, my God, instant wealth. No, no, not really. It's kind of the first phase. Even if you raise over a million dollars, it's really the first phase. 
And, and you have to start thinking like an entrepreneur and start looking at where your expansion money is coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Do you have do you own the intellectual property that the patents on your list? No. How do you protect yourself against somebody in China to bring your life? You you really can't. You really can't. Um, now by the way, we do have you know, this is our first phase is sort of to do what we're doing now. Um, I have some experience with IP, um, uh, several patents, and I, I I can tell you that I'm a little bit, you know, patents are wonderful um, if it's something that, you know, everybody understand what a patent does, Matt, if, if I misstate this. <laughs> The non-lawyer's version of a patent is it protects you from having other people doing your patent. In other words, if somebody, you own a particular concept, it's like owning a piece of real estate, I own that intellectual idea. That doesn't mean you're granted the right or anything like that. It means that you can go to somebody else that's doing the same thing and say, stop doing that. But that process is not easy. You can send letters, they can ignore you. Their lawyers can get in touch with your lawyers, and in many cases, just nothing happens unless there's huge stakes involved. So I have to tell you, the IP stuff and, and, and uh, you know, is, is really kind of a level up from what I'm doing with the year. But a small organization, it's just so expensive. Oh, it's, uh, I, I've been through this. Um, my, what, what I'm gonna do with the Iron Buds is, we are looking at a couple of unique IP things, because uh, yeah, I'm an engineer, I like IP. But, but for the most part, we're building a brand. We want to build this brand as quickly as possible. And, and that's where our equity is. But, but building a brand is IP, right? So when yep. you say IP, it's not just the patent. You know, my typical advice to clients is look at your whole, look, look at your product or your idea or your system or your service, and you gotta give it a holistic IP review and figure out which pieces of IP are most important which are most protectable and which are most cost effective, right? And from there you can make a decision. But it's very tough, no matter whether it's a Kickstarter project or not, to fund protecting the IP with patents in particular because they're expensive. But even building a brand is going to be expensive. You know, getting the word out that Iron Buds is different than the, you know, off-the-shelf Chinese no-name brand. They look the same, maybe from the same factory. Why is the brand better? What if you already have the patent or patent pending? That's what I know. Well, then you have the same issue that was just mentioned, which is you, now you still have to go enforce it. Uh, you know, so you can send nasty letters, have a lawyer send nasty letters, but at the end of the day, if they ignore you, you've got to bring a lawsuit. Why, That's why the nature of the beast. Yeah. I don't see any other way. Could be. I, I thought I might hear a lawyer today, but I think probably not. It depends who's infringing. I mean, if it's a real company that's infringing and they don't want to step you know, on the wrong side of the law, sometimes they will back off just because they know they're doing something that's technically illegal. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes sometimes they will, sometimes they'll, they are uh, with a gorilla in the room, we don't care. Or, or more frequently, I think it's somebody who's not a big company, but maybe are buying the same product from the same factory and just putting no brand on it or a different brand on it and selling it for 25% less. 